in, um, in 1930, a few years after their marriage, Archer and Anna Huntington purchased property in coastal South Carolina, just south of Myrtle Beach. Anna had been diagnosed with tuberculosis and their original plan had been to build a winter home that would serve as a retreat from the world while she recovered her strength. Within a year, they had decided to create an outdoor museum to exhibit sculpture among native plants and animals and to establish a nonprofit corporation to protect and operate it. Brook Green Gardens opened to the public in 1932 and by 1934 had grown to include several gardens featuring landscape settings for sculpture interspersed with reminders of the 18th century plantation. Eventually the property expanded to include a total of 9,127 acres with about 350 acres open to the public and the remainder left as natural habitat for wildlife and undisturbed archaeological sites. There were several high and low points during Anna's life in 1931 and 1932. A high point certainly was July 13, 1931 when Brook Green Gardens, a society for southeastern flora and fauna, was founded by the Huntingtons. In 31, she was also elected a corresponding member of the Academia de Bellas Artes de San Fernando in Madrid, Spain, and she was the first woman to become a member. In 1932 and then on into 33, Archer and Anna Huntington spent a year in Switzerland at a tuberculosis sanatorium for her health, where she received what was considered a cure at that point in time. Also in 1932, she began to use aluminum as a medium for sculpture, and Roman Bronze Works in New York City casts her first piece. In 32, Adela Beebe Hyatt, Anna's mother, dies at the age of 92. In May of 1932, Anna drew a butterfly-shaped design for walkways in the sculpture garden, and a series of gardens were created the old avenue of live oaks formed the axis of the new garden space, and spreading out from this center were gardens created by Anna's design for the upper and lower segments of the butterfly's left and right wings. Its antenna curved toward the original steps at the plantation boat landing and toward duplicate steps constructed by the Huntingtons to achieve symmetry. In the late spring of 32, Brook Green Gardens opened to the public. Also that same year, Archer and Anna Huntington donated their Adirondack estate to the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse University to be used for research and education, and it's now known as the Adirondack Ecological Center on Huntington Wildlife Forest, and is comprised of 15,000 acres. Mm -hmm. Anna Hyatt Huntington was awarded an honorary doctorate by Syracuse University, and she was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And in, in 31 and, and 32, 44 sculptures were accessioned into the Brook Green Collection, including some of the landmarks in the, the uh, original sculpture garden. So, what I've tried to do is is to take well I have done I've taken excerpts from Anna's diaries which are very difficult to read they're written in, in a kind of <coughs> shorthand that she developed and her handwriting when she wasn't writing in this shorthand was absolutely terrible <laughs> She was not known for her English skills, <laughs> better in art, and she was also very direct, very forthright in, in what she wrote, and to the point, it was um, not long gushy sentences about what was happening in her life, although I'm sure she could have written a novel or two about, based on what was happening in her life at that time. But it was always these little short clipped, uh, not even complete sentences. So what I'm going to do is to 
give you a few of, of, of these, try to anyway. Uh, there are hundreds of them, and I've tried to pick out some that I could illustrate. And trust me, it's not <laughs> easy to do that. <laughs> I, I tried to get, if possible, uh, photos that were contemporary with the time that she was writing about, but I didn't always succeed in that. So you'll, you'll see the differences. <laughs> On January 31st, 1931, she writes, Dr. Wilson was here, discouraging about my condition, backwards instead of forward. Will now do nothing at all <coughs> except lie on my back and sit on the porch. <laughs> she was not feeling good. Um, in February, <coughs> Mr. Christie, who worked for the Newport News Shipyard and Dry Dock, which was owned by <coughs> Archer Huntington in Virginia, Christy going up to NN, which is Newport News, took five do dozen eggs with him and a check for $6,500 to offer for a boat. <laughs> I, I don't know whether the eggs are in payment for the boat as well. <laughs> I suspect not, but that gives you an example of how she writes in her, her diary. It's not always clear what's, what she's talking about. See, the first pair of dogs put up at gate posts. And that's, that's all she has to say about this momentous time in, in uh, Brook Green's life. That's the original entrance to uh, Brook Green Gardens. The, of course, the highway, U.S. Highway 17, that we, we know today didn't exist. There was a dirt road. Uh, known as, as State Road 49, but that wasn't the entrance to Brook Green Gardens in those days. This was, today it's a pedestrian entrance. It's right behind Youth Taming the Wild, the sculpture that is off of the traffic circle. When you come down past the admissions plaza and get onto that traffic circle around the pond, you'll see Youth Taming the Wild and Limestone by Anna Hyatt Huntington on the right, it's after the bronze cowboy and, and bucking bronco called Touching the Sun by T.D. Kelsey. And right behind that is the Great Dane Gates. Question? How old was she in 1931? Um, 65. Really? Yeah. She, she also designed all of the, the gates within Brook Green, including this one, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, about that. They were built in Charleston? No, the gates were uh, constructed in uh, Miami. A company named Tito and Roger from Miami got the contract. She also writes in February that uh, Mr. Kaminsky, mayor of Georgetown, and Mr. Mercer proposed that Archer run electro-wind power at his own expense. <laughs> but Archer declined initially. We know he changed his mind about that. Uh, the initial proposal was horrendously expensive. Beach's statues of boy and squirrel placed in Brook Green Garden as central figure. And that was Chester Beach's sculpture titled Sylvan of uh, a fawn standing with, with a squirrel on his hand. It's, it was in the center initially where Dionysus is now and was there for probably, I think, until 1936 when Dionysus was acquired and placed there. And today it's in the Brown Sculpture Court with the other white marbles. I couldn't find a good contemporary picture of it, so I, I didn't put it in, but I think you all know which sculpture that might be. Uh, Kaminsky and Mercer here again from Georgetown, trying to get Archer to subscribe $10,000 for electric line to come from Georgetown. And of course, it has to come across the rivers because there's no, there are no bridges at that time. So this, this was a big project. Uh, they, are, they are to get others to come in. Archer did this. Conway people made no move to accept his offer, even though 
Mr. Christie warned them they were slow. <laughs> so the company from Conway was also bidding <coughs> to bring power from the other direction to Brook Green. And they, they did, weren't quick enough, so they didn't get the job. Archer hopes to make a place for bats to roost and breed in the tower. In a Texas experiment found they exterminate malarial mosquitoes. And that's the, the tower, uh, central tower at Adelaide, which actually houses a, a water tank uh, that provides uh, water under pressure to the house. But uh, Somehow he was going to get bats in there, and I, I really don't know if that was successful, if they were able to, to make that happen. <laughs> Dr. Norris came with Dr. Green from Conway, who is to look after the people on our property and have a clinic four days every week. This is in March of 1931, and the Huntingtons did build a clinic on site. It's now part of our administration building and their offices housed in it. But up until the early 1950s when a uh, uh, hospital was built in Georgetown, the clinic operated as a free clinic for anyone in the area. And there was a, a nurse who was hired by Archer Huntington and there were two doctors and a dentist who were paid by Archer Huntington to come and uh, see people in rotation. They, you know, had they weren't necessarily there every day. She says four days a week, and the dentist I know came one day a week. <laughs> I did find that reference later. By March the seventh, they had the first clinic, and the mayor of Georgetown came over and wanted to talk to Archer about placing a hospital for soldiers here. <laughs> Her, her <coughs> diaries are full of reports of requests for people coming for money. It's constant. And of course, you, you have to remember it's the Great Depression. This is a very poor area anyway, aside from the Depression years. And it, it wasn't so much the poor people asking for money. It was the people who had money who were asking for more money <laughs> for projects, different projects. Where are these diaries? Are they literal diaries or is there a record? They're, what I have are, are copies. Um, her papers went to uh, the research library at Syrac Syracuse University at her death. And that's where the original diaries are housed. I wish I had them because all I have are parts. Um, when I, I went there to look through them many, many years ago, um, they would copy them and they won't do that now uh, because of the condition of the paper. But I only asked for copies at that time of sections that pertain to Brook Green. And there's, of course, so much more that we didn't get. March 11th, she writes, My Diana up in pool, men still working on low wall around it. And the Diana pool in the, at the entrance to the sculpture garden originally did have a low brick wall around the edge of the pool. It was only about two feet high. And it was open work brick, and there was a little tiny gate. Uh, in one side of, of the, that wall behind, at the back side of the, the sculpture. And that could be opened and then you could walk down steps into the pool. This was for workmen, not for the public to do. <laughs> and uh, that gate and the low brick wall were, were removed in the early 1980s uh, because the wall was actually starting to fall down. Uh, Children like to walk on it and sit on it, and it was an accident waiting to happen. So they, uh, the wall was removed, but you can see the little gate, which is known as a wicket, hanging on the wall as you enter the Brown Sculpture Court. 
where the, the restrooms are. The dentist at the clinic pulled 48 teeth today. <laughs> Colonel Bishop was here with plans for a church and a school at Parkersville to be started this summer, no doubt asking for money to help build that. Uh, they are digging for the foundation of the Tarbox House, and I'm happy to say that our, the offices for my department are now in the Tarbox House. The dentist was here again, this was March the 14th, from Georgetown. Archer told him to get a dental outfit for Brook Green that cost $1,500 and he would pay for it. Who's the dentist? Um, <coughs> Dr. Green, I believe, was his name. And he actually was in Conway, but he also went to Georgetown to work and <coughs> back and forth. Then, also in March, the roof of the studio is run and Mason's starting the Walk of Tower. So, this is, is part of the covered walkway that bisects the central courtyard of Adelia. And she's referring to the studio that's in Adelia. On March the 24th, Archer sent Dr. Norris, who in those days owned Litchfield Plantation and also had a, a small clinic there, uh, sent him a check for $5,000 to pay for a doctor and a nurse for one year. <laughs> and toward the end of that month, Archer gave Mercer the first $5,000 for electric lights. <laughs> Burroughs and Collins, familiar name, business name, Burroughs and Chapin Company now, uh, were here and they want $60 an acre for their land worth $15. Anna was always <laughs> writing <laughs> about <laughs> how people assumed because they weren't from here that they didn't know anything, <laughs> didn't understand business. Uh, so anyway, $60 an acre for their land worth 15. Said that they would hand over part of the money to, to the Conway Hospital. So Archer said that he would give the hospital $5,000 himself and $45 to them for the land, but they wouldn't take it. <laughs> That was March the 27th. By March the 30th, she writes, Mr. Doyle said Burroughs and Collins would sell for $45 now. <laughs> but Archer declined. <laughs> I think ultimately he did buy that property, but at least at this point in time, he, he, he was very much about teaching people lessons. <laughs> um, let's see. Mr. Ferguson, in April, uh, Mr. Ferguson is the head at that time of the Newport News Shipyard. Uh, he and his Navy commander brother came in on a small Navy craft boat and landed at the garden. And in those days, you could come in down the waterway or the Waccamaw River and come in through the creeks and, and, and dock at Brook Green. In fact, you could do that up until the early 1960s. Commander Ferguson was the man who raised the Maine. <laughs> yeah, lots of interesting people. Um, the cesspool inspector said that Mr. Daggett had them all wrong, <laughs> which is not a good thing. <laughs> The Palashik group from Rome has come, and that's Forest Idol. It's in the center at the, the back edge of the sculpture garden. And Archer is planning a small pergola gallery, is what she called it, for small bronzes to the back of the garden house. And the garden house was uh, where the restrooms are now at the front of the Brown Sculpture Court. And that had been the overseer's uh, house that had been brought over from the site 
next to the current Low Country Trail. And it had actually been moved there in the 1880s, and it was used to house the overflow family of the people who owned Brook Green Plantation at that time. And then after this became a hunt club, it was the caretaker's house for the hunt club. in the right spot. <clears throat> Archer is laying out the snake wall over at the garden, and that's the serpentine wall of the, the sculpture garden, you know, that, that curves. A sample iron grill is here, made after a photo that Archer gave them. $300 each, made by Tito and Roger. We'll have them at all windows on the court, the outside windows to have perfectly plain ones, as you see here. Not, those are not ordered yet. And uh, Tito and Roger was the firm from Miami that fabricated the window grills and all of the wrought iron uh, handrails and other features for Adelia, as well as the furniture that she designed and the gates for Brook Green that she created in the 1930s. Archer bought a freight boat, 61 feet, for $3,000 that will be used to go for freight at Georgetown as they were, were building Brook Green. They needed to have something large enough to get materials up the river. Archer made a contract with Mr. McQuaid to make the roads to, to the stable and the wharf for $7,000. And that road is now known as Magnolia, LA. It uh, starts at the boat landing where you can take the Springfield and goes in front of the Low Country Center and then straight on up to where Youth Taming the Wild is located now. Archer began drawings of three buildings at the entrance gate, and some men came to sell us Spanish furniture, but we're trying modern metal. <laughs> <laughs> no old and antique stuff for us. She put a big exclamation point after it. <laughs> Two men came, oh, oh and these are uh, examples of uh, some of the wrought iron furniture that she designed and were for Adelia and were fabric fabricated by Tito and Roger. Uh, that's a dining room chair on the left, and there were numerous chairs like that. They were in the dining room, but they were also used out in the courtyard. And then that's a, a, a log holder yeah. for one of the rooms. Samuel Mortimer and Joshua Ward, father and son, uh, visited. The father was born on Brook Green. I am beginning to wonder how many people were raised here since several came last year to say so. <laughs> <laughs> Woodside was here again to lunch and he's still working on Archer to buy. This, this is the, actually the Ocean Forest property in Myrtle Beach which Archer never bought. <laughs> Mr. McQuaid sent a large piece of sturgeon. It was excellent firm meat. However, they will be destroyed since the state now allows people to catch them on their breeding grounds. And she was right about that. Went over to see Palashik's new statue, the building and the wall. And they're setting up one of my jaguars against the snake wall. So that's reaching jaguar, which is still in its original position. You walk through the, the gate into the Live Oak Alley. It's the sculpture, first sculpture on the left. In May, two men from the brick company upstate came to apologize about the poor brick and the layer size sent in the last shipment. They couldn't afford to lose our business. We have had over a million brick 
and might need the same amount next year. Yeah. yeah. So do you know what company that is? I believe that it's the Exum company in Camden. Uh, they also got brick from Ginyard Brick in Columbia, or West Columbia, and I think another brick company in Orangeburg before everything was completed. Archer went over to Sandy Island and, and saw about a small room for Ham's wife. And Ham is the, the nickname for Abraham Harriet, who was the, considered the mayor of Sandy Island at the time and was also the spokesperson for the Sandy Island community. And his wife uh, had cancer. And the Huntingtons really did quite a lot to try to get her uh, medical care, proper medical care, and when it seemed that there was really nothing that could be done for it to keep her comfortable, because she didn't want to leave Sandy Island. And Archer also ordered a wharf built and some flats to carry rice and animals for, for the Sandy Islanders. Mr. Ford from Georgetown and his son were here, and Archer gave them $1,000 to disperse for charity. He ordered fruit to be sent to Ham's wife, and Doyle was here. No result about Kimball's place. They want a fancy price. <laughs> and, and that's the, the Kimball's who owned Wachasaw Plantation to the north of us. Uh, they were, were trying to sell it to the Huntingtons, and it they never did buy it. I kind of wish they had, but they didn't. <laughs> I'm sorry if any of you live in Wachasaw. <laughs> I ordered 20 yards of mosquito nets for Ham's wife. And this is the, the mid-May, and at that point they, they left Brook Green uh, to, to go back to New York. And then in December they returned to Brook Green. It says, arrived at Wilmington at 3 p.m., and Brook Green about 9 p.m. The driver nearly ended our career. He stopped just in time to miss plunging into the canal. <laughs> Farrell took advice to take a different road to Myrtle Beach, not a direct one, which was worse, and we were three hours late. I, I don't know who Farrell was. Apparently he was the driver who met them in Wilmington. Um, Mr. Parrish met us at Myrtle Beach to take us home. The place looked interesting and foreign in appearance as we entered with the great blaze from the entrance fireplace. The puppies were tired out, but they were good on the journey here. <laughs> they always traveled with dogs. The chimneys have to be raised as the fireplaces smoke badly in certain high winds. Put Italian oil jars at the front door and they look well. And her phrase when she thinks something really looks good is, it looked well. <laughs> she wasn't one for effusive uh, elaboration. Is that her name? No, that's Margaret Main, who was the butler for Adelia. She, she worked for the Huntingtons also in New York, and they had a staff of the butler, uh, cook, and maids who traveled with them from New York to here. <coughs> and usually they would come, oh, and a housekeeper too, they would come uh, about two weeks ahead of time to get the house ready and then would stay behind after the Huntingtons left to close it up when they would be gone for an extended time. Are, are those the jars that are in the Palmetto? Yes. Oh, yeah, that the, um, they're known as Beots, and it's a, a common storage jar design in France and, and Italy, often used to store grain and olives and olive oil, so, but they're decorative at Adelia as well as uh, around the Palmetto Garden Pool. <coughs> An enthusiastic letter from the Charleston Museum came about the furniture we sent and, and a photo of the Huntington Room. 
they uh, had given some of Archer's mother's uh, furnishings to the Charleston Museum for uh, display that the staff at the museum were going to name the Huntington Room and apparently they were very pleased to get that gift. Um, in fact, she writes the next day, some newspaper clippings came from Charleston about our gift of furniture. It seemed to please people. <laughs> what happened to their furniture? What happened to the furniture from... Um, well, we have LA. some of it. Oh, okay. But um, it also went to some local people uh, in the community. Uh, when the Huntingtons decided that, or Anna decided, because Archer Huntington had died by that time, that she wasn't going to use Adelia again, then some of the things that she wanted were packed and sent to her home in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, other things were given to people who worked for Brook Green or mm -hmm. friends that they'd made in the community. <coughs> But we do have several of the, the dining room chairs, like you see there in the background. We have other chairs that were not as ornate, and log holder, two different log holders, uh, fireplace tools, and all of these had been designed by Anna Hyatt Huntington. Archer, on December 10th, she writes that Archer said, most men who come want to see his new electric razor. <laughs> I bet that was novel, and I can't imagine how big it must have been. <laughs> um, the next day, she writes that, uh, hung the big bell in the tower, the one the shipyard gave us. And of course, that's the bell that's over in the sculpture garden now. Oh, wow. By December 15th, Anna fears that her TB is starting up again because of all the coughing she's doing. Let's see. December 17th, uh, Mr. Ford from Georgetown came, and uh, this is C.L. Ford and C.L. Ford Jr., and they often received money from Archer Huntington to give to uh, people in need in Georgetown that Archer wouldn't have known or, or, or have known about. And Archer gave him $25,000, which was quite a large amount. They also sent $100 to Mrs. Kaminsky for the restoration of the Winya Indigo Society Hall. Archer went to the Norrises and said he would take on 100 Negroes and pay by food. And Norris offered to handle the buying and distribution of the food. A family can live on 45 cents worth of food per day. On December 24th, all of the regular men went home. Archer went to Georgetown, saw Kaminsky, and called on his mother. Archer gave food and money to many people in Parkersville who needed it. They were, they were greatly excited and blessed him. December 25th was a beautiful Christmas day. Archer finished the drive in Parkersville and gave away 35 more strips of bacon, and that's you know, like a big chunk of bacon, coffee, sugar, and a pail of candy five, five for the children. Five families got five dollars, and 41 single people got one dollar. Sent over the extra to Sandy Island as more are employed there. Gave a Christmas gift of fifty dollars to Mr. Tarbox and Mr. Lashcott. And after Christmas, on the 27th, Archer went around and gave Christmas money to, to several families at Brook Green, not on the regular list. And that's down there? 
That's yeah. that's Archer. Yeah. He's actually standing on the roof of Adelia. On December 30th, she's extremely critical of sculpture by her protege and good friend, Catherine Lane Weems. <laughs> she said, Kay Lane sent me a, a reproduction of her design for the Harvard Biological Building, just finished. But the main group of elephants, which I didn't have a picture of, was the only one with design or imagination. The others were a little dull, and the drawing was poor. All have the rarity of animal written out. <laughs> so the, the elephant group was the uh, etched in brick along the top of the building like the pelicans are. Uh, sorry, I don't have a picture of that. And then she did the pair of rhinoceri that went at the front entrance of the building. So, I don't know. Adam must have just been having a bad day, is all I can say. <laughs> and she would also write notes to herself <coughs> at the end of entries on certain days. And they were, it usually had to do with ideas for sculpture because she wasn't sculpting at this time. She was too weak to work. Mm -hmm. But she could draw, and she was still uh, writing down notes of future sculptures to work on. Zebra stallion, always squealing. Make the group of three colts playing into a group of zebra stallions as they are always kicking and biting one another. Study of bear and cub turning over stones, which they do with a sideways sweep of the forepaw out and away from the body, and cub eats slugs, etc., under stones. Mother bear and cub, very characteristic for cub to stand on hind legs, supporting itself with one paw on mother's quarters. When black bear move in a hurry, they put their rear feet well outside forepaws, thus arching their back to well above the line of the head. Arabs in action with turbans half torn off in battle. <laughs> I never saw her do a sculpture like that. A coiled snake for doorstop. Dogs and puppies, mother lying with head turned back, licking a puppy sprawled up on her back. All of those other designs that she described she did create. In 1932, January 2nd, men all working New Year's Day, the day before. An airplane landed perfectly on the beach this morning. It was young Mr. Ford. He had bad news. The Georgetown Bank and 42 others closed. Mm -hmm. Archer is trying to stop the check of $25,000 that Ford <laughs> deposited, but it couldn't be stopped. Oh. Yeah. Even Archer Huntington got caught up in the, the bank failures. On January the 8th, men finished the arcade over the court walk. And Dr. Wilson from Charleston came. No signs of tuberculosis increase. And she was as, about as excited as she ever got in her diary about that. The doctor said it was all right for me to start modeling small things. Robin, was she ever cured? Um, no. Uh, there's really not a cure for tuberculosis. And what she got at the time was considered to be a cure, but she always had to keep track of, of her temperature. She wrote it in her diary each day and how much she had coughed up and you know how bad her coughing was. Wow. Yeah. Who were the people in this picture? <laughs> that is uh, Anna and Archer on the left and then three of the staff from the Hispanic Society of America with yeah. the, some of the Huntington's dogs. The French mm -hmm. Echo, the Greyhound in the center, and either Geisha or Hugo, the French Bull Terrier being held. And the, the two women uh, sort of in the front are on the left is Elizabeth Gay Trappier, from the Charleston 
family, Trappier, and she was the curator of painting at the Hispanic Society. And then on the right, holding the French Bull Terrier, is Beatrice Gilman Prosky, who was the curator of sculpture and became the documenter of the Brook Green Plantation, uh, excuse me, the Brook Green Sculpture Collection uh, early on in, in the 1930s up until her last book in 1968. And she was my mentor. What was her name again? And then the woman in the back is um, I think her first name is Agnes, her last name is Spalding, and she was a photographer with the Hispanic Society. This is out on the, the front porch at Adelia. They often would pull the breakfast room furniture out there through that Dutch door. And many of, of the, the doors in the house in the 1930s were Dutch doors so that they could open the top and the dogs wouldn't get out. <laughs> and of course, that, those doors aren't there anymore. They've been replaced. When did your mentor die? She died in 2001. Really? At the age of 102. Wow. Yep. Tarbox is setting out young palm plants from Florida. Uh, Frank Tarbox, there we go, okay. young palm plants from Florida. He was the first horticulturist hired for Brook Green Gardens and literally is the person responsible for even how the garden looks today because the, the bones of the sculpture garden, aside from the the plants from the 19th, 18th and 19th century that still existed here uh, were all brought in by him and the garden design is his. Anna drew the walkways in the shape of the butterfly but she didn't design the garden plants. Uh, that was Frank Tarbox and of course it continues today with staff in the horticulture department. Noel's article in the Charleston paper about the place came out today and that was Adelia being written about and that's also the, the um, um, news and courier and I guess it was the Charleston News and then the evening was the Charleston Post back at that time. The cuts were very poor in the article fair and the editor also put headings of poor taste in <laughs> and called our plain brick structure a $300,000 mansion, twice what it cost. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, if she could see the, the sign out there in front of it that says Adelia Castle, that would be gone. <laughs> because she, she was adamant this, this is not a fancy house. <laughs> The Charleston Museum writes that they have made us both benefactors of the museum. The first husband and wife to be made benefactors in the history of the museum, which is the oldest in the country. She was proud of that. Two lions at garden placed on temporary pedestals at the new barriers in front of pool to keep motors back, meaning cars, vehicles, and out of danger of running into the pool. In those days, you came through the Great Dane Gates, which I showed you earlier, drove down what is now a pedestrian walkway, straight to this spot in front of the Diana Pool, and then and the lions were on either side up on pedestals that were stepped to keep uh, cars from driving straight up into the pool, and then you would pull off to the left to park, which is basically the area where the Sculpture Garden parking lot is today. The owner of Belle Isle came to see Archer, another man in trouble of foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Woodside was here again. He said that Archer could make millions if he buys Myrtle Beach land, 
But Archer said that he didn't come south to make millions out of the south and their people. He came to spend money, not to take advantage of the bad times by buying valuable property cheap. It says a lot. Mm. Yeah, the shoes that were ordered from Sears Roebuck for 300 Negroes came. Nara said that with 300 families, we're supporting about 1,200 people. On February uh, 18th, this is in 1932, Archer called at the Kimballs. They were in New York. Then he went on to Baruch's to return their call and was asked to lunch to meet Winston Churchill, who was to visit them this weekend. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Nesbitt and Mr. Edward Milby Burton from the Charleston Museum are coming to lunch. Archer gave young Burton $1,000 to go and study up on furniture. And of course, Milby Burton uh, was longtime director of the Charleston Museum, and his, his book, Charleston Furniture, is the Bible of uh, the history of, of furniture, both built in Charleston but also owned by Charlestonians, uh, still in great demand today. And Archer gave him $1,000 to go and study up on furniture. <laughs> Archer had a fine idea about the small bronze gallery. Instead of a roof over the bronzes and walking around, he's to have a roof carried by double archers, arches running around the curtain of the place, leaving the wall with the bronzes without roof and in full light, separating the public from touching them, an excellent idea. Also to have the curtain, not a garden, but a pool, which will make the place unique and cooler in summer. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure about it being cooler in summer, <laughs> but uh, as far as we know, this is the first uh, outdoor gallery for sculpture in the United States, and also the first to almost exclusively show small sculpture in an outdoor setting. That frog boy, frog baby. That's frog baby. Yeah, that was in the the center of the pool until 1998 when the building was renovated and we did uh, put a roof over the sculpture side and of course left the, the wall, interior wall as it is. They also made the, the pool a lot smaller uh, than it is in this picture. It's, it's hard to tell from the photograph, but it was a very big pool, and it was almost four feet deep, which was pretty deep to have steps going down on one side. <laughs> Mr. Whitelaw, the head of uh, Charleston Art Gallery, which is the Gibbs Museum of Art, came to lunch, a wide awake young man, <laughs> the first mail came by our wagon today. We can get two incoming and outgoing mails by this arrangement, which was a really big deal for Archer because he was constantly sending and receiving mail while he was in residence. Uh, March 21st, I'm doing a model of a terrapin, the first modeling I've done since two years ago. April the, <coughs> the 2nd, Mr. and Mrs. Luttrell Briggs are here from Charleston. They seem to like the garden in spite of being landscape architects <laughs> and a director. <laughs> they were much interested in, in the room furnishings. And Luttrell Briggs was, again, the landscape architect in demand in Charleston at that time and, and many, many years later. And, and the gardens that he designed are are considered masterpieces. Um, so she, w she was thinking that landscape architects surely shouldn't like our, our garden. <laughs> so. Miss Perkins and the cook, Ms. Mrs. Bernard, have gone to Charleston. That's Mrs. Bernard, the cook. They succeeded in being let into the Huntington Room at the museum to see the collection that we sent them last fall. It seems that the room is generally closed on Sundays. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I know how hard it is to get into closed rooms in museums. <laughs> <laughs> Almost impossible. On April the 13th, she, she writes something that I think is very interesting. The painter is putting light gray-green paint on the grills, and they look better. These are the metal grills on the windows at Adelia. It lightens them, and they look less prison-like. <laughs> Archer suggests a touch of the same green inside of the little square of the open-work brick in the sculpture garden. Although you can't really see it, it adds an atmosphere. And I would imagine it does, that it, it would have given a, another dimension to the painted brick walls. Archer had a letter from the governor of the state and the mayor of Columbia to speak over the radio. I wonder what he would have talked about. He, I think he declined, but um, that could have been interesting. <laughs> Archer made contract with the well man from Charleston for two wells, one near the pond and the other in a large circle. And this is the outflow from one of those artesian wells that's up behind Youth Taming the Wild. A lot of people wonder what that is. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what it is. And it feeds the, the pond where Youth Taming the Wild is located as well as keeping other ponds uh, in the area uh, filled. Are those the same stones or like near baby gods, the round? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're, they're millstones. Um, you know, they're millstones throughout the gardens, large ones used as seats, or original seats in the garden, and then Others ornament, uh, ornament like this, and then some are embedded in walkways. Yeah. And they're all from local rice mills. Archer Huntington bought all of them. Uh, you know, people were willing to sell anything mm -hmm. to, to have money in those days. Um, but none of them are from Brook Green's rice mill. Oh. They were, the, the Brook Green millstones were already gone by the time the Huntington spot the property. But we did uh, locate two of them and, and managed to buy one back and it's on exhibit in the, the history exhibit in the Lowcountry Center. On May the 2nd, 1932, she writes, ordered from Gorham, St. Gaudens Puritan, Calder's Tragedy and Comedy, Mrs. Herring's Boy and Frog, Mackenzie's Young Franklin, Lentelli's Fawn, Chachery's Boy and Fawn, and Eberly's Windy Doorstep. Doorstep. So several of the, those 42 sculptures that were accessioned in 31 and 32. On May the 11th, Mr. Bull has drawn plans for two schoolhouses, one on Sandy Island and the other at the New Street and that's uh, on Laurel Hill, which is part of Brook Green's property, the northern end of the property. And it was a new village uh, being constructed as residents of the area through the 1930s continued to offer their property to Archer rather than displace them when he bought it. He built a new village uh, at Laurel Hill with new houses and with conveniences that they'd never had before. And the residents then lived there. And when I started working here in 1975, there were three houses that were still occupied. Yeah. They're all gone now, though. On May the 14th, she writes that they're putting screens and building new outhouses on all of the houses on the place. And I took a photo of Tom's house, as they say it was slave quarters once. Tom Duncan lived on Spring Hill, and his house here was located under the live oak tree that is at the edge of Caroline's Garden as you go into the Offner Center. So it's actually on the other side of the hedge under that tree in the open plaza between Pegasus and 
Fountain of the Muses. That, that's the edge of Spring Hill that continues on to the south uh, next to the Oaks. And it was a part of Brook Green Plantation where the Flagg family lived. And it was the dowry for Georgiana Ward, the daughter of Joshua John Ward, who owned Brook Green, uh, her dowry that she received when she married Dr. Arthur Flagg. And Tom Duncan continued to live here until he died around 1943. Um, Dr. Joshua John Ward Flagg also lived on that property and he died in 1938. Um, because you mentioned the clinic that Mr. Huntington had here. So that, was that at the same time as Dr. Flagg? Didn't he have a clinic? I can't, I really can't hear you. You talked about the clinic that Mr. Huntington ran yes. or paid for. But didn't Dr. Flagg also have a clinic there? Doctor, well, Dr. Flagg was a medical doctor who had ministered to people in the community, but he was one person and was quite elderly by that time and couldn't handle the load of everyone. And then Archer started the clinic the other four days. as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but Dr. Flagg continued to see patients up until the end. He was well known. By May 17th, let's see, I showed you the schoolhouse plans. Um, she writes that McQuaid is going to build the Poinsett House for $3,000. That's one of the houses in the new settlement. Two schools for $6,000, $3,000 each. One church for $5,000, that's Brown Chapel uh, Memorial. At uh, that's on the Wesley Road still, and the walks in the garden for seven thousand, a saltwater pond for seven thousand on the beach side where Adelia is located, the canal to Flags for twelve thousand, and the bridge at the end of the duck pond. <laughs> <laughs> Our old horses home. It seems to cause more comment than anything we have done before, have even asked us to send to Ohio to get old horses. When, when she was convalescing, she w was working out in her mind a uh, design for a new sculpture of Don Quixote. She had done one earlier in the 1920s in relief that is at the Hispanic Society of America in New York. A museum founded by Archer Huntington and she wanted to do a sculpture in the round and she wanted the horse Rosinante, Don Quixote's horse, to be different from any other uh, depiction of Don Quixote and his horse and she sent out word that she needed some a couple of old horses to use as models. <laughs> well, old horses came out of the woodwork <laughs> because she said she would pay. And they got old horses from all over the state. Uh, some were farm horses, some were former race horses. And as she wrote there, they, they even you know, came from as far away as Ohio, um, the word spread, and they started <laughs> what she calls the old horse's home, <laughs> and she wrote after a few months that she couldn't use any of the horses because they'd all gotten fat and healthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's see, an x-ray machine in May is being installed in the clinic at Brook Green. And McQuaid was clearing sites for the school and, and the church near the first house. Other things were going on. She wrote about the old Nesbitt bull goring Z Zane Patch's little buck kid, and the buck died. So there, were, there was all kinds of action at Brook Green. On May the 29th, that's what this slide is actually about, left at 9 a.m. In, in the boat 
and Archer went to inspect Sandy Island Marsh where they are draining for a vegetable garden for the entire village. And he was, he was paying to reclaim land uh, and to augment the soil so that the Sandy Islanders could grow better crops for their own consumption during these, these years. Then we went up the PD to the Waccamaw as far as Enterprise, an ex-lumber mill. Also a large lumber mill settlement in Bucksville in bad shape. Dr. Flagg came over to call. It was a great event as he has not been to the beach, he says, in over 40 years. <laughs> Mr. Wesley was here before breakfast to bring an Indian stone axe. and. That's actually Archer Huntington. Mr. Wesley lived in Merle's Inlet and had a, a small museum of objects that he had collected and some things that he had found locally. And I, I think he charged a few cents to, for people to go in to, to see. But once the Huntingtons came here, he began to give objects of, of interest to the property to the Huntingtons for the Brook Green Museum. I sent word to his daughter that the $140 she owes me on the car that Anna had loaned to her is actually a wedding <coughs> present. And then by, that's June, and then by September they're in Switzerland. And they stayed there for over a year because her tuberculosis had gotten much worse and uh, she went to a, a sanatorium for for TB uh, up in the Alps and received what was considered a cure at that time after a year. Uh, that's it. So.